today on Call Out. Nelson's search and rescue hunt for a missing two-seater vintage aircraft. We're looking for a very small, small airplane. And later, a crash course in air accident investigation. It's important for us to identify if there was any mechanical malfunction or eliminate it. Wednesday, 8 p.m. Nelson Search and Rescue was called out to launch a ground search for an overdue plane. The aircraft is being flown by 83-year-old Ian Gordon Smith, a recreational pilot with over a decade of flying experience. The plane they're searching for is a vintage single-engine two-seater Urkoop. First manufactured in 1939, the Urkoop was designed to be the safest fixed-wing aircraft of its time. Mr. Smith had restored the plane and had flown it for the past 10 years. The plane had taken off from Vulcan, Alberta, stopping in Cranbrook to refuel, then continuing on to Kelowna. Slated to arrive at 5 p.m., Mr. Smith was reported overdue by Kelowna Air Traffic Control, and the search began. A number of people report seeing the plane earlier in the day over a mountainous, heavily forested area near Crawford Bay on the east shore of Kootenay Lake, about 40 kilometers northeast of Nelson. Search aircraft scour the Crawford Bay area for three hours, with no sign of the missing plane or signs of a crash, such as broken branches or trees. But as dusk approaches, a weak emergency locator transmitter, or ELT, signal is received. That's when Nelson Search and Rescue is called in to do a ground search. Search and Rescue military had already been out on it. It's their jurisdiction. The aircraft uh, they believed may have gone down in an area that they uh, was more suitably accessed by ground search and rescue. To get to Crawford Bay, the team must take a ferry. SAR manager Murray Springman uses the opportunity to do a mission briefing which includes addressing one of the possible outcomes. Find his way the subject is deceased. As you all know, do not, you can check the body, but you do not move the body until the corner has been broken. Mr. Rudder, take us right to where that plane mark is on the Google Earth. A maze of logging roads leads them into the Crawford Bay area. It's pouring rain. The team has to clear a fallen tree from the road. They reach the location and are hopeful to find the plane just off the road in one of the open clear-cut areas. They do a hasty search, scanning the easy areas first, aiming to reach the pilot as quickly as possible. Which way? Well, they didn't see anything. The team regroups for a more detailed search of the area. This can be hazardous in the dark. Some areas have cliffs, others have dense shrubs and trees. Some are more open. The location is broken down into four main grids. The teams carefully walk each grid within sight of one another. They flag the search locations with SAR tape as they go to avoid missing any ground. Aircraft continue to fly overhead using searchlights to spot the plane. Four hours later, nothing. The team calls it a night at 3 a.m. and heads back to a nearby hotel where they'll stay and resume searching in the morning. It's now day two. It has been determined that the weak ELT signal detected on day one was only radio interference. More SAR teams have joined the search. We have five search teams here today, Kimberly, Cranbrook, Beaver Valley, Nelson, and Castlegar, and we've got a total of 37 people, and we're expecting the arrival of sleds to go into possible avalanche territory, though, so we've got Avitex on those teams. New information has surfaced. The search coordinators have pinged the pilot's cell phone, sending a signal to it from the cell provider. The phone has sent a signal back. The Urkoop is definitely 11.48 kilometers from the pilot point cell tower, somewhere in a nine kilometer wide path. Normally the search would move out in all directions from the last sighted location, 
Now, all the eggs are in one basket as they comb a single area, Gray Creek Pass. But it's still a needle in a haystack search. Gray Creek Pass is notorious, with a number of small plane crashes occurring here in past years. Small planes use the pass to cut between the East and West Kootenai Mountains. If they encounter poor visibility or bad weather here, pilots will turn back in the tight bowl-shaped area, lose too much airspeed in the turn, and the plane could crash. SAR teams on snowmobiles start searching Gray Creek Pass. We had sent out a hasty team up there to you know, see where the snow line was and how far we could access up the valley, how we could search it. Uh, we probably had about uh, three to four inches of snow that's fallen overnight, and we're looking for any indication of, uh, of an aircraft crashing here. The uh, helicopter's been working this area for well over an hour now. They're not finding much, but uh, who knows, we're looking for a very small airplane that's possibly covered in snow that could be in some very thick brush. By now, it's late afternoon. With 24 hours of alpine exposure, recent snow and rain, and likely injury, the pilot's chances for survival have dropped dramatically. The team calls it a day, planning for an early morning start. Friday morning, day three in the search for a missing plane. Surface fractures of the rolls there you see that. Aircraft, snowmobiles, and snowshoeing teams will all comb Gray Creek Pass today. This is avalanche territory. Dave Smith, an avalanche technician with over 20 years experience, works ahead of the teams. Just trying to look at the safety factor for the searchers, and uh, some of whom will be up near tree line, and we want to make sure that they're uh, not straying into an area of hazard or potential avalanche hazard. He checks the strength of the various layers. A strong layer below may act as a sliding surface for the snow on top, especially if a weak layer lies in between. There's nothing really volatile here. Nothing too touchy. The helicopter arrives. It settles, but stays powered up to avoid sinking into the snow and getting stuck. For the remainder of the day, the helicopter will deposit search teams into various parts of Gray Creek Pass, all the while searching for the downed aircraft. At 4 p.m., the team starts pulling back to debrief. Still no sign of the missing plane from ground or air. Saturday morning, day four in the search for the missing plane. A warming trend increases avalanche danger in Gray Creek Pass. The ground teams have already done everything they can and stand down. The air search continues, going over Gray Creek Pass again and again. One broken treetop is spotted. They lower a SARTEC down through the canopy to investigate. The plane, along with the deceased pilot Ian Gordon Smith, has been found. The downed plane was found exactly where the cell ping had determined. It had been flown over several times, but snow cover made it very difficult to spot. It is now three months later. Chris Armstrong is on his way to Crawford Bay to meet Mardell Chinook, the daughter of the deceased pilot, Ian Gordon Smith. The family of Mr. Smith has uh, come out from Alberta and they've asked to see if they can get out to the, the actual crash site. Um, I'm gonna meet up with him here pretty soon and uh, head up into Great Creek Pass, to see how close we can get to the actual crash site. Hi, I'm Chris. Chris, I'm Rod. And this is Mordell. Hi. Hello. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. So we're gonna go for a little jaunt and see if we can find the location. Okay. okay. I just wanna find a spot where uh, we're the closest point from the road to the crash site. Shouldn't be too much further here. So you see that ridge that runs kind of in the middle here? Basically, you follow that straight up. 2,300 vertical feet from here. 
I felt his journey as we were, you know, driving along the highway. I knew that he had been flying along that highway. To be flying at 83 years old by himself in his own plane, I think, says it all. But that's the kind of person he was, just a free spirit. We've been in for about an hour. We're just under halfway up. When we were making the journey here yesterday, you know, I felt a lot of happiness from him that, you know, it was good for him. So for me, I think this is going to be closure. Well, this is the spot. I knew Transport Canada was coming up here and uh, they've taken away the fuselage maybe in the last two or three days. There's two top trees here. Came in here. The rest of the debris pile that we've seen, broken plexiglass, battery, lots of odds and ends is all strewn through the trees that way. It's just really hard. But at least we found it. I think I hear my dad saying, at a girl. <laughs> he did say it was a trip off the old block one. <laughs> <laughs> when you spend days looking for somebody and you don't find them, you know, it, it rattles around in your head. You want to be successful. You know, long after the subject's plane was found, you know, emails flying around constantly. People wanting to know where he was found, what was the location, what was the long and lap, because they all want to go and Google Earth and see where they searched, how far it was from your search area. It's pretty important. You put all that effort, you got a lot of pride in what you do. You know, people want to know. You get pretty pumped up. You want the closure. Now, aviation investigators search for clues to the Urkoops crash. Along its descent, it had slashed through another tree vertically. A plane crashes in the wilderness of British Columbia. Four days later, search and rescue find the wreckage. The 1946 two-seater Urkoop was found in four pieces, spread out over 300 meters, a relatively small area for a plane crash. What caused the crash? Unraveling the mystery is the job of aviation investigators. We've got to look at everything. We've got to look at the, the environment, the weather, uh, good or bad. What was the aircraft intended to do? The pilot, the human in, in the picture. It's important for us to identify if there was any mechanical malfunction or eliminate it. This is an inside look at how aviation investigators piece together the clues and find the answers. In this case, the coroner has requested the Transportation Safety Board's assistance in determining the cause of death. Many times what we'll do is uh, try and get an impression of the uh, aircraft uh, at the moment of impact. What was the pilot trying to do? All facets are examined. What was the weather like when the Urkoop disappeared? There was no real severe turbulence forecasted for the area. There were, however, certain types of clouds, such as towering cumulus cloud, which are conducive to some turbulence. The investigators try to get to the site as soon as possible, before weather can wash away any markings on the terrain. Markings in the snow are one of these things that we look at, impact with trees and uh, scarring on rocks. In this case, it had already rained and snowed, but the crash site still had a story to tell. Well, when we initially uh, reached the accident site, and we overflew it and examined the treetops, the fact that there was not a lot of tree damage indicated that they had to have come down almost vertically. The propeller had signs of power at impact. The engine being forward of the whole wreckage was an indication that it was powered. Also, along its descent, it had slashed through another tree vertically. That's another indication that the propeller is turning. Knowing that the engine was powered eliminates a number of factors from the crash. If we had an indication that there was no power, then we have to start looking at why was there no power? Was there fuel? Was there a malfunction in the engine? Did it just suffer from the environment? We can make some leaps when we get a good indication of power. 
they bring the wreckage back to their warehouse to look at other possible factors. It's not in thousands of pieces like a large jet crash could be, but the same investigation principles apply. Behind me here, we have the wreckage of the air coop, which we've recovered to this inspection facility so that we could lay it out and have a better appreciation for how the air coop was damaged in flight or from impact with the ground. A closer look at the propeller supports the theory that the plane was powered. As the propeller tries to pull itself through the air, it tends to want to pull itself forward. And as it was pulling itself forward, it's also left some indications through score marks here that it is, in fact, rotating at that point in time. As engine components lose lubrication, heat will cause failure. If it's unclear whether or not the engine was running at the time of the crash, they will look at the magnetic chip plug this device attracts metal particles in the engine oil that have been worn from various engine parts. If the engine can't be run, they will tear it down for a closer look. We can determine whether the material came from bearings, pistons, like connecting rods, because their chemical composition is often very different. A plane's instruments can be revealing, sometimes showing the speed or rate of descent at impact. Instrument dials will have a needle that when impact occurs, will slap against the back of the instrument dial and leave an imprint or an indent or some kind of transfer of paint. The antique Urkoop's flight instruments were vacuum powered. As the wings separated, the vacuum tube system also separated. When the vacuum system detached, the instruments failed, leaving no clues. Warning lights on the instrument panel alert the pilot to engine problems. They also provide clues for investigators. If a warning light bulb was on during impact, the filament will be more elongated than a cold, brittle filament. There were no warning lights and the Urkoop was powered, but were the flight controls working? One of the considerations during the examination it yeah, has to do with finding whether the aircraft's flight controls were continuous, meaning that everything was attached and capable of functioning in flight. We'll look at the control column, for example, its linkages right through. If we find that any of the controls, for example, are fractured, we'll look at how they fractured and determine whether they are a pre-existing condition. Though the controls are broken, a closer look shows that the components were functional before impact they were not a factor in the crash. The most important clues may lie in the wings. Did the wings break off before impact? Uh, did they get hit by a tree? So we'll be looking at leading edge damage. A dent or deformation in the wing can show a plane's angle of descent at the time it impacted an object. In this case, they didn't find substantial leading edge damage which suggests the wings had already broken off before impact. Both wings had snapped off right where they meet under the fuselage, but why? We determined that uh, we had better uh, have uh, a closer look at the fracture surfaces. A fracture surface is the area where a break occurs. It can shed light on whether the metal has been overloaded by outside forces or fatigued over time by corrosion or wear. Fatigue failures are, are distinct in that they often will show a type of beaching mark, which shows that there has been a progression in the failure. The main structure of the wings, known as the front spars, are the strongest parts of the wings. When we look at this fracture surface, we note that uh, there is very pronounced bending right to the uh, ultimate failure of this material. It is consistent with an overload event. The investigators can now paint a picture of the events based on all the facts they have determined. The plane was powered and the controls were working. It was unlikely that there was severe turbulence. The wings fractured due to a structural overload. The most likely scenario we could come up with was that the pilot somehow had exceeded through a full deflection of the flight controls, the structural limitations of the wing. The plane plummeted almost vertically and left a limited field of wreckage. 
A plane traveling at relatively high speed, as in a dive, can cause structural failure of its wings, either by pure aerodynamic drag or by a maneuver that adds forces beyond the wing's design strength. The wing spars of the Urkoop showed damage consistent with the maneuver that resulted in disaster. Investigators can't speculate about possible reasons. They try to find answers and make safety recommendations. The facts and conclusions of this crash investigation will go into a letter to the coroner. It's a team effort, and we're trying to make sure that there's no facts that we haven't assessed. We hope that knowledge will allow all those involved in the industry to avoid the, the risks that are out there. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.